Um, so I'm Jeff DeVelco, Director of the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. We're fortunate to have John Barnett, who is a geographer for the University of Melbourne in town. And John, I want to ask you about RED, or reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, which has become uh, quite quickly, in fact, a major focus of the discussions around the December 2009 Copenhagen negotiations, the next conference of parties on the climate change negotiations. Um, lots of potential promise in the eyes of some in terms of generating income for, for communities that may not have uh, great sources of, of income from keeping some of those poor stands standing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there seem to be some um, real questions about what this really means, this adaptation strategy and uh, mitigation strategy, what it means on the ground in terms of making it happen. So how, as we're in a transition from in theory to practice, what is it that we need to keep in mind? I guess, I guess you can think about, it's a very complicated issue and I don't think we've thought about exactly what the, what the, the final policy form of this might be. I guess we need to think RED ultimately, or the ultimate objective of RED is to reduce emissions from deforestation. The idea is that, that we could support, well, countries or communities and or communities to, to reduce baseline growths of emission and the carbon that is saved is, is a good thing. And, and there's no doubt that deforestation and forest degradation is a major cause of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So the principle of controlling that problem is absolutely sound. Um, but the problem is a modality, I guess, and, and the current discussion is about countries generating certified emission reduction credits that are traded on a clean development mechanism type market. So the countries are effectively paid for reducing these baseline growths of emission. And I'll come, I'll come back to that in, in a little while. I guess the issue is then you have to think about what causes deforestation. And the causes are very complex and, and vary from place to place and, and is, is compensation to communities or governments necessarily going to solve the causes of deforestation? One of the major causes of deforestation is inadequate clarification of customary property rights of individuals. Another is that on communities, that communities may acquiesce to demands for forest clearing, for agricultural expansion or for logging because they need to find ways of paying for basic services like healthcare and education. If they had those services, they might be much less likely to, to want to engage in those things. Other circumstances, communities' rights are simply violated, uh, there's corruption in government, um, and, and rates of extraction are very high because, because value isn't being captured in the economy, which is also a function of bad policy. So, so bad policy, both in a national sense in terms of the forestry sector, um, a lack of clarification of, of customary property rights and a lack of rural development are probably the three main kind of institutional causes of deforestation. The question is then, is paying governments going to necessarily solve those problems? Or, and, and generating it through certified emission reduction schemes, the, the appropriate mechanism for doing that. In some, that's, so there's, there's that issue. In, in terms of its environmental effectiveness, for those causes of deforestation such as logging, which are not particularly capital intensive, a country that enters into a red scheme, uh, the, the logging companies may just simply move to another logging area somewhere else in the world, so there'll be carbon leakage. So to control red, it must be every country with a significant forestry reserve, at least in terms of that, that logging issue, needs to be part of the red scheme. Mm. Every country that needs to be part of the red scheme is going to have to comply to a monitoring and, and surveillance system to make sure that their baseline rates of change are and up there, so it's going to have to be an, an independent regulator. So unless RED is a global regime with a proper independent regulation system, there's going to be carbon leakage. It's not going to be environmentally effective. We shouldn't bother with it, at least in terms of generating CO2. In terms of the social, the social elements of that, and on our, it's not clear that countries are going to submit to that kind of compliance regime and that every country will join a RED scheme. And if they don't, then it's going to be a big loophole. The social justice issues are slightly are also problematic. It's not clear that in many of the countries of the world where there's corruption in logging and where, where governments have not respected customary property rights or have not funded rural development, that paying governments to, to do that is necessarily going to produce those kind of outcomes anyway. Um, 
where the barriers to implementation of those things are a lack of money, then there may be some value in supporting governments to do that. We don't have enough money to implement our forestry policy as opposed to, to we don't do it because we're corrupt. We don't have enough money to implement rural development as opposed to not doing it because we'd rather spend money on the armed forces. Um, then, then paying governments to do that might, might work uh, to overcome some of those barriers, but often that's really not what the barriers are. The barriers are about uh, an unwillingness to, to do those sorts of things. And so paying communities in that sense might be useful if it means that they can invest in rural development and, and, um, and help sort of secure their own property rights. But that requires government policy. The, I think the danger is that generating, if it's going to generate certified emission reductions, sooner or later governments are going to have to get their hands. It's going to be a national agreement. There's going to be an agreement between countries. And those CERs are going to flow to governments. The question then is whether those CERs flow down to communities, or whether governments actually take those CERs and impose restrictions on the rights of communities to develop to stop them reducing their forests in exchange for nothing else. So you could imagine a situation where a government's generating a rent because of controlling uh, deforestation and imposing restrictions on the development rights of communities in order that they can continue to get that rent, which seems to me to be not a realistic proposition and a fairly difficult one. Then you'll have a situation in any event, even if payments go to communities, of, of effectively receiving a rent for a non-productive activity being the principal source of livelihood for communities in forested areas, which I think is also problematic. We know in many parts of the world, and including in the Pacific, where you have communities living on, on a rent, that it's not a very it, it's not a very good way of organising a society. It's not a productive and vibrant society, and, and, and you do tend to get um, a lot of division within communities about capturing that income, and nobody's producing it, and there's no exchange in a sense for any, any production or value of activity, and that's also very difficult. So <clears throat> there's a lot of issues to think about there. It seems to me if we were really wanted to control emissions from deforestation, decoupling that process from the trading of certified emission reductions between countries would be a very good idea. There might not be as much income generated through a market, but if developed countries are really serious about this, then, then through development channels and the giving of, you know, of grants, for example, they could do things like help clarify customary property rights, help provide rural development, help clear up corruption, help strengthen forest policies and the forest monitoring and enforcement anyway, which would control deforestation, that doesn't have to be tied into this imperative of governments to generate an income from reducing deforestation, because that's where I think the problem comes. A market mechanism is the problem. Well, I think, I think, you've, I think you've quite clearly stated if, if a program sounds uh, in some ways too good to be true, uh, then, it, then it is. That complexity is really there. And, translating the principle, as you say, which you can widely agree is sound, to action on the ground and implementation is quite another quite another thing. Well, and thanks, John. That's really